hear our call to worship from Psalm 145, verses 8 to 13. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Well, good morning and welcome to Canterbury Presbyterian Church morning service. What a wonderful joy it is to be able to gather around the Word and to be able to hear from the Word as we uh, respond in faith by the conviction of the Spirit. And may the Holy Spirit really move in our hearts this morning uh, as we hear Him, as we hear the Lord and His Word and as He uh, achieves that which He purposes. Uh, We know the promise that His Word will not return empty. And so may we cling to that and trust that His grace is irresistible and unstoppable. Uh, If you're visiting, may may you be particularly welcome this morning and know the Lord's grace and and His presence with you. Uh, But for all of us, may we not grow weary or lose heart, uh, particularly as that day is coming. And may this be a real uh, awareness of the means of grace the Lord has given each of us uh, to persevere, and not barely or merely, but to persevere with great joy. So let's come before our Lord now. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you that you are gracious, that you are full of mercy, that though you are rightfully uh, wrathful uh, of, of evil and in your pure goodness and holiness, you cannot uh, tolerate uh, wickedness. Uh, we thank you that at the same time, by your covenant grace, your promises, you are slow to anger and full of steadfast love. Uh, we thank you that your love is shed abroad into our lives, your people. Uh, we thank you for your mercy and your patience uh, with us. Uh, that you are good to all, Lord. We see that your common grace is over all, uh, over all that you have made. Uh, You send the rain on the just and the unjust alike. Uh, Lord, uh, we thank you and we praise you for your grace and your kindness. We thank you for your uh, particular grace in our lives as your people who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Uh, We thank you uh, that uh, we are your people and that you are renewing and transforming us. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, And Lord, we also... Praise you that you are the merciful high priest, our Lord Jesus, and we come before you knowing that you are able, uh, not only able, but you are uh, willing to intercede at the Father's right hand. And so we confess our sins in the quietness of our heart now uh, that you uh, know already, uh, but that uh, you call call us uh, to confess uh, that we would humble ourselves before you. Lord, we thank you for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, We thank you uh, that we can know your grace uh, abounds. Uh, We praise you for that, Lord, uh, that uh, by the mercy and merits of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have uh, forgiven us and you have cleansed us and you promise to renew us as we come before you, as we turn away from sin. And so we pray that you would strengthen us uh, for more works of service, uh, that we would Go about them uh, with uh, more purity of heart uh, for your glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll hear the word of assurance from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. What a wonderful, refreshing word that is. Let's continue uh, to bow before our Lord and yet uh, in a slightly different way uh, with joy in the singing 
of the first two hymns, I Stand Amazed in the Presence and then How Deep the Father's Love. Oh, dear. 
announcements for this morning. First of all, a big thank you to those who helped out yesterday at the Working Bee. Uh, it was uh, wonderful uh, to be able to get uh, lots done and to be able to uh, get things cleaned up around the church. Uh, with all those uh, plain tree leaves, they're certainly uh, great to have those many of those cleared away. And you'll notice also in the uh, in the uh, space in, in uh, behind the pews that there are rejoice hymn books. Uh, thanks to Kevin that put those out there. Uh, really, for anyone that prefers to uh, look at the hymns uh, and also the musical scores uh, for those who are sight readers, uh, so we thought that'd be a, a good addition and a great sign as well that uh, that COVID is um, gradually fading by God's grace. Uh, we've also got a few other matters. The board will be meeting via Zoom this coming Tuesday at 7:30. Uh, PW, PWMU will be meeting in, in the Bamboo Hall on Thursday at 10 a.m. with Andrew Letcher uh, from PIM. And there's a sign update, the sign, the long lost sign. I've heard that they're hoping to be able to start installation this week. And so that's a, a wonderful blessing. Won't that be a joy um, when that is, is finally put in place? Uh, it's, um, yeah, obviously delays from COVID and supply and demand and that kind of thing. So uh, our Sunday at five service will be uh, Reverend Peter Hasty preaching. So I, I really commend that to all of you. If you're able to come, it'll be a, a wonderful uh, privilege and joy to hear Peter speak on the Christian's great passion from the Beatitudes. Uh, so uh, yeah, look forward to that. Uh, also after the service tonight, wonderful opportunity to be able to gather as God's people and enjoy fellowship at Susan Hill's home uh, for a bring and share dinner. Uh, after the 5 p.m. service. We have our Bible reading now, uh, the first reading uh, from Judges 16. Thanks, Alex. So the Bible reading this morning is from Judges chapter 16, verses 1 to 22. One day, Samson went to Gaza, where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, at dawn, we'll kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Some time later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sarek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so that we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered her, If anyone ties me with seven fresh thongs that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh thongs that had not been dried, and she tied him with them. With men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the thongs as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, you have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, Until now you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, If you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric on the loom 
and tighten it with the pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric, and tightened it with the pin. Again she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin and the loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until she was, he was tired to death. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head was shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that, she, that he had told her everything, she, went, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. Having put him to sleep on her lap, she called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes and took him to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him grinding in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after he had been shaved. Amen. Boys and girls, it's that time of the service where we have our children's talk, and we remember that we've been hearing the Lord's word from the book of Judges, and as Alex just read the sto- a part of the story about Samson, we're coming towards the end of the mini-series about Samson and, and the children's talks about Samson. Today is the last one about Samson, and we remember uh, that last week that Samson, uh, the Lord used Samson to defeat the Philistines or the Philistines in unusual ways to make them look silly, remember, and to remind us that Jesus had easily beaten our enemies. And so there's Samson tied up, and then all of a sudden, he breaks free. And that's to, that was really, that made the Philistines look silly as he defeated them. And then it reminds us about our great Lord and Saviour, who defeated our enemies of sin, the bad things around us in the world, and the devil himself. And so we must not fear. And today we're going to hear the last part of the story of Samson. That's very sad, but also amazing, uh, as God teaches us uh, that, uh, that he will not be defeated. And as we trust the great Lord and Saviour, we know that we won't ultimately be defeated either. Now, Samson, we remember, was also a man who lived in disobedience to God. We see that in his love for a lady called Delilah. Now, Delilah didn't love the Lord. Delilah didn't love Samson either, though Samson loved her. And Delilah actually pretended that she loved him. And she, she was wicked, pretending that she loved him when she didn't. Well, the Lord knew how much harm would come to his people if they married other people who followed other gods like Delilah. And so he commanded them not to do it. But do you think Samson followed? No, he didn't. And he did suffer harm because of his love for Delilah. But do you think that could stop the Lord? No, nothing can stop the Lord. Not even Samson's sin and the great suffering he went through before he died. Uh, Because the Lord, even though he departed from him, was actually with him in the end. And though it looked like Samson had been defeated, God came back and was with him and he won. When the Philistine rulers heard about Samson's love for Delilah, they went to her and said, find out the secret of his great strength so that we can capture him. And if you do that, we'll give you lots of money. Well, I wonder how Delilah felt about that, boys and girls. How do you think she might have felt? I love money 
more than I love Samson. Dear, oh dear, Samson was in trouble. Well, Delilah then said to Samson, please tell me where your strength lies so that someone could overpower you. Samson said, okay, if they tie me up with seven fresh strings, I'll become weak. That's exactly what Delilah did when Samson fell asleep after inviting the Philistine men into the house to hide and then capture Samson when he woke up. Delilah shouted, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Immediately, Samson woke up and snapped the strings very easily. Well, Delilah was upset that Samson had lied to her and she asked him again the secret. Again, he lied and told her that if they tied him up with new ropes, then he'd be weak. Well, Delilah did the same and then Samson easily broke free. Delilah got angry again and Samson told her another lie. And then Delilah for the third time did the same and again Samson easily broke free. But finally, though Samson had been tricking Delilah and Delilah had been pretending and now Delilah really managed to find out after she said, how can you say I love you when you don't share your secrets with me? You've made fun of me three times now and you still haven't told me what makes you so strong. Well, she kept nagging Samson until he shared his secret with her. My hair has never been cut, he said, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me. So, boys and girls, what do you think happened then? Yes, Rena. Sorry? Delilah gave him up, shaved his head, yes, that's right. She, she shaved, she organized for his head to be shaved. She called a man, one of the Philistine men in when he was asleep and they shaved his head. And then when Delilah woke Samson, he, he found out that he was weak because the Bible says the Lord had left him. The Philistines made Samson go blind and they captured him, and they gave Delilah the money. They made Samson grind mill at the grain in the prison. But the Lord hadn't left Samson for good. The Bible tells us that his hair began to grow again. What do you think that might mean, boys and girls? Samson's hair began to grow again? Yes, Maddie. His strength, his strength will gain again. His strength will gain again, that's right. God was going to be with him again shown by his hair growing. And a big gathering that happened sometime later in the, the Philistine temple, uh, 3,000 of them gathered and all their leaders were there to worship their false god because they thought that that false god had given them power to capture Samson. Little did they realize it wasn't the false god, but it was the true and living god who'd let them capture Samson. It was all part of God's plan because the Philistines called for Samson to make fun of him. He asked the servant to help him feel the two pillars upon which the weight of the temple rested. And then Samson prayed, Lord God, please remember me and strengthen me only this once. And then he asked that he would die with the Philistines and he pushed with all his strength. And God heard his prayer and he strengthened him. The whole temple came crashing down and everyone, including Samson, died. And the Bible says that Samson defeated many more of God's enemies by his death than in his life. Boys and girls, who does Samson especially remind us about who defeated God's enemies? Our enemies of sin, all the bad things in the world around us and the devil himself by his death. Who does that remind us of? Who does Samson remind us, remind us of? Who defeated enemies by his death? Yes, Judah. Jesus, that's right. The greatest one of all, the greatest saviour, the Lord of all, uh, because he first loved us. Uh, just like Samson, not even our sin or the sickness or sadness we might go through is the end for those who love Jesus. Uh, he loved us, and as we trust him, when we trust him as Lord and Saviour, we can know that he defeated our enemies 
through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead on the third day, never to die again. Uh, He is our greatest saviour. He is the only true saviour. He is the one who has saved us. And all he asks us to do is to trust him, boys and girls, and we can know that he has overcome our enemies because of his pure love. And so let's pray now and give him great thanks. Let's, Let's pray. Our dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the story of Samson. We thank you uh, that in his death he defeated, began to defeat the great enemies of your people. Uh, We thank you for the way that he reminds us of Jesus, who by by Jesus' death uh, overcame the great enemies, the greatest enemies of all, and that as we trust him, we can know that you have defeated the enemies, those enemies in our life, and that one day we won't face those enemies anymore when we're with you forever. And so we thank you and we praise you, Lord. Please help all the boys and girls to trust Jesus as Lord and as Saviour. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, boys and girls, you can head out to Sunday school for those who go out. uh, You can go out with your teachers. I now invite uh, Reverend Dong Choi to lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving and for others. Thank you, Dong. Uh, let's come to our God in prayer. Let's pray. Um, our gracious Heavenly Father, we um, gather here today on this Lord's Day to appraise your great mercy and goodness to us. Uh, we thank you for your gift of spirit um, who guide us and lead us to the truth. And we thank you that through your spirit uh, we can find your grace and mercy um, in Christ Jesus, uh, where we can find forgiveness of our sin and enjoy uh, this wonderful fellowship of prayer. So you have indeed told us to, uh, through your precious word that Uh, Whatever we ask to the Father um, in Jesus' name, um, he will give us. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you that because of your great mercy and grace, uh, we can boldly um, come before you in prayer. And we thank you uh, for the assurance that um, you would listen to our humble prayers. And for this reason, uh, we come before you uh, with joyful hearts, uh, with with the sure hope that you would guide us according uh, to your riches of mercy and wisdom. So Heavenly Father, we uh, first of all um, pray for the ministries at Canterbury. Um, We thank you that uh, we were able to start um, new small uh, Bible study groups at Canterbury. So we uh, commit this time to pray for the newcomers Bible study group on um, on every Wednesday and also the leaders training group on Saturday mornings. Uh, We pray that uh, the study um, would provide opportunities for the members to grow in knowledge and grace of our Lord um, Jesus Christ. And we pray that the study um, would also provide a good opportunity of fellowship uh, to build, up, build each other up and grow in Christ. And we especially pray for our senior minister, uh, David Hahn, as well. Uh, please give him strength and wisdom um, as he leads uh, both of the groups. And uh, we um, also pray that uh, more members at Canterbury um, would be willing uh, to join uh, various study groups during, uh, during the weekdays. Um, as we learn from the Bible that devoting ourselves uh, to the teaching of your precious word was one of the essential marks um, from the early church. So we pray that uh, many of the members at Canterbury um, would devote themselves to join the study groups and, and learn from your word and grow in discernment and holiness. And Heavenly Father, we especially commit this time to pray for our evening service as well. Uh, We thank you that we had the opportunity to freely share our thoughts on the matters of um, evening service last week. And we pray uh, that by your blessing, uh, we would be able to revitalize our evening service. Um, uh, in, In some sense, it's really sad to see uh, many of today's church are uh, losing uh, the tradition of having the evening service. So we pray that uh, we would really restore uh, the meaning 
uh, and refresh our understanding of the, of the Lord's Day, uh, where it is a day we devote ourselves as, as a day of worship and rest. And we pray that many of the members would accordingly um, devote themselves to worship you, not only through the morning service, but also through the evening service as well. And Heavenly Father, we also um, uh, continue to pray for our Japanese congregation as well. Uh, we thank you for uh, sustaining the members of the congregation despite the long vacancy of a Japanese minister. And we continue to pray uh, that you would provide a Japanese pastor, a right person, who can really nurture and feed the congregation uh, with your precious word. And we really pray that the congregation will be greatly strengthened to reach out uh, to the Japanese community in Melbourne. And Heavenly Father, we also uh, commit this time to pray for the sick members at Canterbury as well. And we especially commit this time to continue to pray for Ben and Sarah's family. Um, as they especially travel to South Korea this week uh, to meet their family. Um, having a long flight with two young children uh, could be a real challenge. So we pray for your travel mercy. And we pray that um, they would be courageous and compassionate uh, to share uh, the gospel message with their father. And we pray that by the power of your mighty sp spirit, um, he would come before you in repentance and receive Jesus as his only Lord and Savior uh, through faith. And we pray for the family that uh, they would be able to know and experience the love and mercy of our Lord, and they would accordingly uh, praise uh, the riches of your glory and mercy. And Heavenly Father, we um, also commit this time for, uh, to pray for Hyunju and Hyunjin's father in South Korea as well. Um, it's sad to hear that uh, their father is now um, diagnosed with stomach cancer, uh, yet we thank you uh, for your providence that uh, the doctors were able to find um, the cancer in early stage. So we pray for your provision that uh, he would be able to receive uh, the medical treatment he needs, and we pray that the treatment will be effective um, to eliminate the cancer. And we thank you, uh, we also thank you that he is a firm believer as he serves as an elder of the church. And we pray that um, during this difficult period of life, um, he would draw near to you and he would accordingly know and experience your greater comfort and loving care um, during this difficult time. So Heavenly Father, we um, pray for the rest of the service now. Uh, we, uh, we pray our hearts and mind uh, would be fully devoted to you um, as we worship. And as we listen to the word of your word, uh, we pray we would receive your word humbly and may our hearts be filled with love and reverence of you. And we all pray all this in the precious name of our Lord, um, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Dom. The, now we have uh, time set aside for uh, the offertory. And again, if you're visiting, please do let this time pass, knowing you're our guest, and uh, that it's um, a joy and a privilege to be able to contribute as we're able. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have lavished your grace upon us. We thank you uh, that in uh, a thanks, thankful response, we can uh, contribute a portion uh, to you and the work of uh, your kingdom uh, here in and through Canterbury Presbyterian. And so thank you for all your generous servants, uh, your faithful servants. We pray uh, your blessing on us and on the ministries here at Canterbury. 
uh, that you would be pleased to continue to strengthen our hand to be able to do the good works you've called us to do with wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, may the Lord be pleased to prepare our hearts uh, in the singing of our next hymn before we hear the word read and preached uh, at the cross. second reading, continuing Judges chapter 16, is from verse 23 uh, through to the end of the chapter. Judges 16, verses 23 to 31. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country, who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, call Samson that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he entertained them. They made him stand between the pillars, And Samson said to the young man who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, and on the roof there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, Please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Then his brothers and all his family came down and took him, 
and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had judged Israel 20 years. Well, let's commit this time to the Lord now and ask for his help. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your servant Samson. We thank you for the faithful record that has been preserved for us all these years later. We thank you that by the power of your spirit, uh, you take your word and you apply it to our hearts for our encouragement, for our strengthening, uh, that we would uh, grow and be strengthened in faith. And so, Lord, please do uh, help me as I preach your word, that it would be empowered by your spirit and in, in, in the spirit's truth. Lord, please uh, take... Uh, the word and may you open our hearts to receive your word that we would grow in your grace in Jesus name Amen well, We come to our fourth and final uh, sermon in the mini-series on Samson within the wider narrative of the book of Judges we're continuing uh, to go right through to the end of Judges over the coming weeks but here we come to the last one on Samson and it really is in many respects the most well known part of Samson's life in his alliance with Delilah and what happened in the end in his death. Uh, remember that Samson, by God's grace, had been set apart uh, even prior to his birth when the Lord, uh, the angel of the Lord, visited Samson's parents and told them he would be set apart as a Nazarite. Uh, that's what Nazarite means, set apart. It's a vow. Uh, that the Lord made at the time he visited Samson's parents. Uh, and there were three particular aspects, remember, to that vow. Uh, firstly, no consumption of grapes or alcohol. Secondly, he wasn't to touch a dead body. Uh, thirdly, no razor was to be taken to his hair. Well, as we saw in chapter 14, detailing the initial events of the life of the young man, Samson, he'd been living in rebellion in regard to lusting after the Philistine woman of Timnah and also breaking the number six Nazarite vow regarding the dead lion's carcass that he gleefully scraped out honey from and then shared with his parents as a bit of a joke. Most probably, he also broke the vow with regard to grapes at that seven-day feast, the marriage feast that he had in Timnah. The alcohol would have been most probably there at the time. The only part of the vow that he seems to have kept to date is in regard to his hair. Though he'd been set apart by the sovereign Lord and constrained by the Spirit to uh, begin to save Israel from the Philistines, Samson's life had been dominated by sin, selfishness, indulgence, immaturity, lust. And now in this final chapter, we see further moral decline, not only with two more pagan women, but with the complete breaking of his vow in regard to his hair. Well, commentator Barry Webb, who was also a lecturer of mine in Sydney, I had the privilege of sitting under him, had this to say, Samson is not just Samson, he is also Israel. He is separated from other men, but he longs to be like them, just as Israel is separated from other nations, but is continually drawn to them. He goes after foreign women, as Israel goes after foreign gods. He suffers for his willfulness, as Israel does for its... And in his extremity, he cries out to Yahweh as Israel has repeatedly done. But now it is Samson alone who does so. He is remnant Israel, Israel reduced to a single man. He really is a judge for the times, uh, imitating Israel and their fall in almost every way. Though we can hardly condemn Samson without considering ourselves. Being united to Christ by faith in our fallen world also involves struggle to walk consistently with our identity as those also who have been set apart in a way, by contrast, 
so much greater than Samson by the power of the Spirit through the work of Christ. And yet, we struggle, don't we? We struggle to live lives consistent with who we are in Christ. We often stumble. And we can be overwhelmed by our own sin and the shame that comes from it. And so a question before us, particularly this morning, is do you feel defeated? Do you feel weighed down? Do you feel like uh, there's shame in, in your life and there is no overcoming? It's a dark cloud that just doesn't seem to go. And though the bright face you might present to those around you uh, is there, and it might be the last thing that others would think, in your quiet moments, in your heart of hearts, you actually feel defeated. The wonderful, sublime encouragement from this passage is that as Samson appears to be utterly defeated just at that time, by the unstoppable power of the sovereign Lord, he comes into his finest moment in his death. No more does Samson remind us of our Lord and the victory of our Lord in his death and his cruel suffering than this time in this chapter. In Christ, we have the Saviour who achieves victory to overcome the struggle. He overcame and by faith, we will overcome. Ultimately, never to be defeated. So let that be our encouragement this morning. Uh, as we see this chapter really uh, having three movements, uh, we first see the danger of the night in the first 14 verses. And then uh, we see Samson uh, having been blinded uh, in that, uh, both metaphorically and literally. And yet, in that second section, we see hope in that final verse of that section, a hair's breadth of hope. And then finally, uh, we see that Samson, uh, by God's grace, has sight and brings salvation in his death. So the danger of the night, we read from verse one, Samson went to Gaza and there he saw a prostitute and he went into her. The Gazites were told, Samson has come here. And they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night saying, let us wait till the light of the morning, then we will kill him. But once more, Samson's sin with a foreign female comes to the fore. She's the second nameless Philistine woman to become the object of Samson's lust. Uh, though Samson had probably been judging Israel for the most part of 20 years, uh, for a significant part, as uh, chapter 15, verse 20 has already said, he's still obviously a wanted man in Gaza, uh, a city that's there to, the, to this day. We've heard of the Gaza Strip. Uh, the people of Gaza set an ambush. Uh, ready to pounce at dawn. And instead, in a massive feat of strength, uh, Samson rises at midnight and rips the city gate out of the ground as a victor's trophy, you might say, and carries it 60 kilometres to a hill facing Hebron. I was intrigued uh, by a... a an archaeological uh, finding and then uh, one scholar's take on it uh, where the strength output he calculated uh, for Samson to have done that was about 28 horsepower, uh, which I've found out also is about the power of two big draft horses. Uh, though that's probably still only a fraction of Samson's strength that he displayed in that. Uh, elite sprinters can apparently produce uh, for a very short time, a power output of about three horsepower. Uh, and what we see in this is that Samson's com compromised character also, alongside his superhuman strength gift, had made him presumptuous, that he was invincible. 
Four times in two verses, the Hebrew word for night comes up. In verse three, it's night with an extra word that means half, rightly translated in the ESV as midnight. Uh, uh, In the NIV, I think, in the middle of the night. What we see is the hint in the text that though Samson had become presumptuous, and though he had, in this instance, outwitted uh, the Philistines who lay in wait for him, uh, the divinely inspired author wants us to see that Samson was in great danger as the night was closing in on him. And so he moves from Hebron Hill in Israel, uh, the hill opposite it, uh, back to its boundary with the Philistines in the valley of Sorek. And there we read in verse 4 that he loved a woman whose name was Delilah. She's the only one of the three Philistine women uh, in Samson's life to be named. And the first verb for the other women he saw is, uh, sorry, for the other women is he saw. Uh, So the woman of Timnah, the prostitute, he saw. Uh, For Delilah, it's He loved, he loved. His affection for her is doubly dangerous. And the significance of night and the danger for Samson continues with her name, Delilah. It's a wordplay on night in the original language. Uh, The two words are almost almost identical with with the exception of D. Uh, So we think of the name, you've probably heard the, the, the name of a woman called Layla. That comes from the Hebrew word for night. Uh, So it's very similar, Delilah. Uh, And we see her danger in verse five. The lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, seduce him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him and we will give each of you 1,100 pieces of silver. Uh, The Philistines had what's known as a pentapolis, uh, five leading cities. Uh, And assuming there were five representative lords, uh, that would have made the total 5,500 pieces of silver. Uh, Judges chapter 17 verse 10 uh, tells us that the average low yearly wage was about 10 pieces of silver, 10 shekels. By today's standards, they were offering Delilah about somewhere in the range of 20 to 30 million dollars. And so the Philistines are here. Game begins. And Samson tricks Delilah with various scenarios about what what makes him weak. Verse 7, bind me with seven fresh bowstrings. Verse 11, bind me with new ropes. And after each event, as for each woman, Samson's strength easily overcomes the Philistine threat. And though each woman at the same time takes him closer to the Philistine heartland, from Timnah on the edge to Gaza in the heart. And with each tease of Delilah, we also see him moving into a more dangerous situation. She is the woman who has the greatest power over him of the three women. He must have known her game, but for him, she was intoxicating. He thought he was impenetrable. With such feats of strength, it's easy to see how he'd grown proud. In Samson, we really do see what happens in entertaining sin. We might also compare sin's deceit with a game what's known as cat and mouse. So we think of it like this. We fool ourselves into thinking sin is harmless, like a mouse. We're in control, like a cat. No fear, no threat, just fun. So we browse the internet. We watch television late at night. We whisper to one another in secrets, to unload, thinking it's harmless, thinking it might even be good. We believe the devil's lie. 
that there's something fulfilling in what we're doing in this moment of pleasure where we're getting things uh, that we want to, uh, to achieve to give us some instant sort of relief. At the same time, we think we're being strong. We're impervious to falling, to being damaged. We even might think back on all the good things we've done, the gifts, the way we've served. Uh, perhaps we start depend, to depend on those things for our own identity. Uh, we become proud. And at that time, we become vulnerable to falling, particularly because we're dull to the spiritual danger we're in. Like Samson, before we know it, we fall. In the, sh in the shame, if we are ashamed, praise God. The Spirit convicts us. He causes us to repent as we respond in grace and humility. But if we keep resisting, grieving the Spirit, hardening our heart, we continue to become blind to the danger. And that's a summary of the spiritual downfall of Samson that happens in our lives uh, to greater or lesser extent. And yet there's grace for us, as we'll see, ultimately there was grace for Samson. Uh, even though at this time as the game it takes a perilous turn, for the first time in his, since the birth story, the subject of his hair comes up. Verse 11, you can see how, how closer he's getting to falling. It's an anatomy of sin's demise. And we must take this to heart. That's what the, uh, the divinely inspired author, that's what the Spirit wants us to see the danger of flirting with sin. Verse 11, weave the seven locks of my head with the web. So Delilah attaches his hair to the weaving loom and for the third time makes, wakes him to say, the Philistines are upon you. And with the third failure, and given Samson's love for Delilah, his demise is really sealed. As she echoes the woman of Timnah, the woman he was married to for less than a week. Verse 15, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and you have not told me where your great strength lies. He had even more invested with Delilah than with the wife at Timnah, which builds the tension with the news in verse 16 that when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. She wore him down until we read the ominous words of verse 17. He told her all his heart. And with that, he betrayed the secret of his Nazarite vow about his hair. At Delilah's call, the Philistines arrive with her fortune and after... Samson falls asleep, they shave his hair. After tormenting him, we read, the, the word there is to mishandle. Uh, she mishandled him, didn't care, roughed him up to rouse him again from his sleep. We read the sobering phrase of verse 19. His strength left him. Then the particularly stark word comes in verse 20. He thought... I'll go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Samson's thinking really captures the essence of what had brought him down. Self-sufficiency, presumption, expectation, vanity, being insensitive to the presence of the Lord. Uh, pride and presumption also led him to cheapen God's grace in his life. And now the man who had once had the strength of multiple horses is reduced to a shell. And the physical blindness that had come upon him had its roots in his spiritual blindness. The other loves that had already blinded him to God and to God's glory. Former moderator of Australia, Reverend David Jones, uh, preached a very helpful sermon on this passage, and uh, I just uh, 
share some of it with you now. Uh, he asked the question, if God were to withdraw his spirit from us, would we even notice? He talked about uh, a Welsh preacher uh, that had been uh, lined up for their assembly, uh, for the Welsh assembly by the name of Robert, Rob Robert Roberts. Uh, Robert Roberts failed to turn up for this uh, preaching engagement at a particular assembly and so a search party eventually tracked him down and they were outside his home and they heard him seemingly talking to someone in his room and they went in and found him on his knees pleading with the Lord saying, I won't go unless you come with me. Oh, for more preachers like Roberts. David Jones said the pulpit is the loneliest place in the world if the Lord doesn't show up. It's a tragedy that people think they can stand and preach the word of God because of their preparation alone, because of their natural abilities, their charisma, their eloquence. They don't realise many times the spirit's not even there. God forbid that the spirit departs from this pulpit God forbid. That's why the prayer meeting is so important. Jones reminded us as well. We need the anointing of the Spirit on the preaching of the Word. Praise God for the prayer meeting. Let me commend it to you. Sunday morning, 9.45, if you can, even just come for a portion of it. Because the preachers from this pulpit Preachers from pulpits in all churches need the blessing of prayer, of the commitment of those who pray for them. I need your prayers. I need your prayers. Reverend Dong Choi needs your prayers. Every preacher who stands here needs your prayers. Please pray for us that the Spirit would anoint us, undeserving frail servants as we are. And yet, in our weakness, may God's strength be magnified for your blessing, for your encouragement, for your perseverance, for your joy, for your uh, final arrival at the throne of grace to be welcomed, uh, either at your death or if, if the Lord returns before it, to receive you and to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, just when all hope seemed lost, uh, the f man, poor man, having his eyes gouged out, bound, grinding grain at the mill in the prison, we re read verse 22. His hair, the hair of his head, began to grow again after he had been shaved. We use that term, hair's breadth, to mean a very small margin. And it described Samson's hair in the prison, so small as to be unnoticed by the Philistines, but a sign of hope that though God had left him for a moment, he hadn't ultimately gone away for good. His hair began to grow. God hadn't uh, broken the covenant with Samson though Samson had broken it time and again with the Lord. And so the final scene has 3,000 Philistines gathered in their temple, dedicated to their god, Dagon, who was most probably a, a fertility god. Uh, they praised their idol, thinking it had delivered the, uh, Samson to them, and they humiliate him publicly. He asked the servant to place his hands on those two pillars. Incidentally, archaeological discovery of temples around uh, uh, ancient Palestine have found uh, such uh, constructions where there were two pillars uh, that supported the weight of the temples. And for the, uh, it required uh, probably a man who was at least six and a half foot tall to be able to stretch out between those pillars. That was the distance they seemed to be apart. 
That was Samson. Though a shell of a man, he comes into his finest moment. For only, it seems, the second time of his life he prayed. Verse 28, he says, O Lord, God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And then he asks to die just after that. With all his strength, he pushed and God heard his prayer and sent a surge of power through his body and the temple fell, crushing the lords and all who were there. At the end of verse 29, we read, so the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. God's grace prevailed. In the spiritual blindness of idolatry, that had led Samson to where he was, that had led the nation to where it was. In the physical blinding of this judge who had been corrupted, in the shell of a man whose glory had departed because God had left him temporarily, God came back. He empowered him on this eve of his death. Hope remained and in his life stood to be redeemed by his death. By God's grace, triumph would ultimately happen. It would prevail in the tragedy to fulfill the promise of chapter 13, verse five, that he would begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. And chapter 13, verse 7, that he would be called a Nazarite to God to the day of his death, remember. That was the prophecy, that it would be to the day of his death. And though Samson's life had been marked, it seems, more by sin than by godliness, doesn't it contrast with the Lord Jesus Christ who never sinned? No more do we see Samson point us to the Lord Jesus than here in his death. We saw it in part in his birth announcement. We see it here, particularly in his death. The finest moment after a tainted moral life, now redeemed. Throughout, the Lord had been doing that, but finally here by his grace. And we think of this in the lead up to his death, he was betrayed for silver. Brutalized, mocked, humbled. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Isaiah 53, verse 3. Yet he crushed our enemies and completed the victory with outstretched arms. Though in our fallen world, with our sinful flesh, with the devil prevailing, not prevailing, but prowling. We struggle, don't we? Many times to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, to keep in step with the Spirit, to live consistent with those whom the Lord has set apart for his glory. But know this, we won't ultimately be defeated because we cannot, in Christ, be defeated. His grace is unstoppable, just as it is also irresistible. He has overcome, and by faith in him, we will overcome as well. And so if you are feeling defeated here this morning uh, by all manner of sin uh, within your life, or the sin of others, or the fallenness, the brokenness of this world, Know that in Christ, we have the victory. We will not ultimately be defeated because he was not defeated. And he lives and reigns and rules in the glory, uh, the eternal glory at the right hand of the Father. And he, by faith, has secured us our victory. He has given us life by his death and by his almighty resurrection 
to overcome the world and the flesh and the devil. And by faith in him, we have and we will overcome. Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. May the Lord encourage us and remind us and help us to grow in our confidence and to move beyond the defeatism we often fall into that Satan loves and delights us to remain in, to know that in Christ we have the victory and we will not be overcome. Let's pray. Uh, We praise you, Lord. We praise you for your uh, life, your perfect life. We praise you for your uh, life laid down uh, to conquer and overcome the enemies, all our enemies. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Uh, We pray you would forgive us for feeling defeated at times. Uh, Help us increasingly to behold uh, the glory of the cross, the glory of your resurrection and the new life we have in you, uh, that we will not ultimately be defeated. We thank you and we praise you for the victory that is ours in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, Well, let's uh, reflect on what we've heard in the singing of that wonderful hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this morning we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. It is an act of faith that all who trust Jesus as Lord and Saviour are invited to share together in the bond of the Spirit. It reminds us that we have been united to our Lord Jesus by faith in his sin-atoning death and his life-giving resurrection. And the Lord has given us this tangible reminder. He gave it on the night He was betrayed the night before he died in the upper room 
uh, as he shared the meal with his disciples. And it is to remind us that it's only by grace, by the merits of our Lord Jesus, that we are justified, that we stand before him uh, right. We stand before God. Though sinners we are, we are justified, we are right by the merits of Christ alone. And we have adoption in him. We have been sealed by the Spirit uh, that we would appear on the day before him uh, to receive uh, the grace of our inheritance. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so as we share in this meal together, uh, we can trust that the Lord will feed us, that he will feed our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And though we groan inwardly, we can be sure that God is at work in all things for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And so this is a means of grace. It's a means that the Lord has given to us for our encouragement, for our growth, and for our comfort. And just after the first Lord's Supper on the night he was betrayed and as he was about to be arrested, put to death and rise on the third day, appear to over 500 disciples for for around 40 days before ascending to the Father, Jesus prayed, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. And so Jesus' high priestly prayer was for us, that we would be united uh, in him by faith and that we would share the bond of the Spirit together. So brothers and sisters, in this meal, be encouraged that all who trust him now will one day behold his glory in that heavenly banquet together forever. And that is our awesome future uh, that he prayed would be fulfilled. And so let's come before our our gracious God now and ask his help as we come to this meal. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you for feeding us by your word. And now in this communion meal, uh, we thank you. We thank you for the tangible reminder in this world of wonder mixed with the decay of sin and death that you gave your only son, Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And so with thanksgiving, we are doing what the Lord Jesus commanded. We recall before you his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. We acknowledge his reign in glory, and we look forward to the coming of his kingdom when he returns in glory to judge the living and the dead and to restore us to to him bodily, raise us bodily, never to perish again. And so we praise you and we thank you and we ask you would settle our hearts and fill us full of thanksgiving as we share this together in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Uh, We'll retain uh, the receptacles uh, and we'll uh, share the, uh, the wafer and the juice together, uh, together corporately. Uh, so as you receive the elements from the elders, please uh, feel free, please do let this, the element pass by you. If you don't yet trust Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, uh, please continue to think about it, but please do let it pass if, you're not, um, if you haven't yet submitted to the Lord, Jesus as Lord and Saviour.
Jesus said, take and eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ has ascended and he will come again in glory. Let's bow before him in prayer. Our Lord and our God, we thank you that you feed us by your word. We thank you that you have fed us uh, in this meal uh, with thanksgiving in our hearts. We are overflowing with your grace uh, by your mercy, which is sure, just as your grace is lavish. By faith, you have given us the assurance of our right standing before you by grace alone. We have your cleansing forgiveness. We have the adoption as heirs of the eternal inheritance and the profound truth of being able to respond in such a way as to please you. Lord, by the power of your spirit, Strengthen our inner being that Christ would dwell in every part of our lives through faith. And may you grant us the daily increasing awareness of your wonderful grace in Jesus' name. Amen. The benediction before we sing the doxology from the end of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. And sing the doxology, Rejoice 635, now to him who loved us.